Well, nice to see you all here. I do my best for you to understand what I'm trying to talk about. Um, and I hope if you're connected via earphones, you can hear me well. So if you're here, I assume you know what the MLOps is about, right? But I will remi remind you that the MLOps is a set of practices that allow us to bring machine learning models to production in a reliable and efficient way. But what is production? Production means that the results of your machine learning models are being used in business processes and actually deliver value. Let me give you an example. Let's say we have a product manager of fulfillment. And that product manager asks a data scientist to deliver a demand forecasting model. And he starts a POC. And that POC involves a notebook. There is a notebook and data scientist thing well, we need to repeat this process every week, so let me schedule a notebook. And the, there are three steps that are in this notebook globally. So there is data pre-processing, model training, and there are predictions that are computed. And in the end, it's written to a delta table, and these predictions are used by the fulfillment team. Well, is it production? Yes. Is it efficient? Maybe. Is it reliable? No, it's not reliable. And um, what about version control and what about code quality checks? So there is a feature in Databricks called version history. You can see you know, versions of your notebook. Is it enough? Not really, because there are much better practices that you can implement, like CI CD pipelines. Because version control in notebooks doesn't really prevent mistakes from happening. You will only know afterwards if something went wrong and you can see who did it, but that's about it. So, in fact, you need to have CI pipelines where you have pre-commit hooks, unit tests, and integration tests, and you need to have uh, PR reviews, and approval is required to uh, proceed with the deployment. And there is a CD pipeline that actually does deployment to acceptance and production environments, and there is a deployment protection as well. You can set it up on GitHub that approval is requirement to actually deploy something uh, to a high environment. A setup could be similar to that. It's a very simplistic setup that we have one main branch, and there are feature branches that are started from the main branch, and there is a pull request, and there are some CI pipeline runs, some testing, pre-commit hooks, and then you will, um, after approval, it's merged to the main branch. And when uh, the code is merged to the main branch, the deployment starts, so acceptance and production, and only then when there is approval to, on production after people reviewed how things are going on acceptance, it's actually going to production and it's tagged with the version. So this example only would work if your environments are protected. So there are two levels of protection that you can implement on Databricks. First of all, it's protection when it comes to Databricks workspaces. Uh, only d developers can only have access to development environments, and there are service principles that have access to um, respective environments. Like development SPN has access to development environment, acceptance and production have access to acceptance and production. And developing team, like demand forecasting team, can only get access to high environment after they request access to it and someone can improve it. So it's like a temporary access that you can get to it. Um, the next thing that needs to happen is uh, the catalog setup. Because on Databricks, you have a de um, access to workspaces, but you also have access to catalogs. And in fact, um, data scientists should not be accessing uh, any high environments either. They can have read access, but they shouldn't have a write access to any environments. So there are quite some setups that you can implement on the schema and catalog level, and the, this respective accesses, this is something that should be implemented. So only acceptance SPN can write to acceptance, and production SPN can write to accept to production environment. And demand forecasting team can read from the production catalogs and write to development catalogs. So why it matters? You have full control. The deployment can only happen from um, the CD pipeline, and there is also quality assurance. Code only goes uh, to production if there are code quality checks and the tests that have passed. 
So one of the things that matters when it comes to unit testing is packaging your codes. You can't really do unit testing unless your code is packaged. And this is one of the examples how it can be done. It's some dummy code, it's not really important. But what matters is that every code you write can be modularized and put into, um, into your, the package and the package can be uh, created. And that's something that is uh, one of the big pillars of what is required for proper MLOs. Um, another thing that matters a lot is orchestration. I was describing a big notebook that maybe has thousands size of codes. What if it breaks in the middle, right? Then you would have to rerun the whole notebook just to fix your problem. So you need to look at orchestration differently. I explained that there are three main steps. There is the pre-processing, there is model training and uh, predictions. And you can split them all in three different tasks. They can be more, of course, than that, or they can be some conditional tasks. But the benefit of it is that you can retry at any step that where your code has been broken. And also different tasks may have different requirements in terms of libraries, but also in terms of compute. Like pre-processing can be spark heavy and you need to use uh, distributed computing. But when you look at the model training, it's usually, well, not always, but quite often, it's uh, basically single compute that you need for that task. And using um, PySpark or uh, clusters that uh, are required for pre-processing would not be really efficient for this. Um, another thing that matters for orchestration, because you split our tasks, it can be that you need to reuse the package that we created in all these tasks. And you also have some um, configurations file, like a project configuration that has information about the catalog, schema you use, and maybe some model parameters and features you use to train your model. Uh, and that's another reason why packaging actually uh, makes the whole difference. And we just make things a lot more complicated than a notebook, right? So we introduced the package and we introduced all kinds of dependencies. And um, there is a feature on Databricks called Databricks Asset Bundles that actually make it much easier to deploy all your code with all your dependencies. I will not be really go deep into what that uh, is doing, but uh, it will make your life much easier if you are deploying things on Databricks. And it just needs one command, Databricks Bundle Deploy, and the deployment will happen. Um, but what I was talking about, isn't it just DevOps, right? Why is it MLOps in the first place? Um, MLOps is an extension in DevOps, in fact. So there are four main components that um, are overlapping for any software engineering system. There is code, there is data model, there is environment and infrastructure. If all these components are the same, the results of a software system are guaranteed to be the same. But it's not like that for a machine learning system. There is one extra concept, statistical properties of data that matter. And if statistical properties of data have changed, even though the rest hasn't changed, your whole system is broken. That's why you need to have extra tools just to make sure that everything is working as expected. So traceability and reproducibility is really important for machine learning deployments. So for any machine learning model uh, run and deployment, you need to be able to look up what code and commit on Git was responsible for the deployment, infrastructure environment used uh, for training and serving, data used for model training, and also the generated machine learning model artifacts. And these components are really required to be able to go back to experiment at any moment of time. And this is something that can be implemented using MLflow. And Mailflow provides a lot of uh, possibilities to log information related to a run. Um, your project can be uh, bundled across the one experiment and each run, each model training run, can have a separate Mailflow run. You can log input, like log data that belongs uh, to a certain uh, model run, log model, log metrics and log parameters. And there are other artifacts that you can log as well. Um, and another thing that we found very useful is adding tags to your runs and to your models. And tags can commit git commit hash, meaning that you know what code was responsible for the run, but also the run ID on Databricks. Uh, because that's something that um, is available in the Mailflow right away, but it's a task run ID. And you want to have a global run ID of the whole deployment so that you can go back and look at it. 
And when you log a model using a Mailflow, you can then register that in Unity catalog. And that can be used later for serving or for other uh, purposes. There is another component uh, in, ML, in uh, Databricks called Lake House Monitoring. That's something that um, also uh, helps a lot with tracking the statistical properties of the data. And there are two aspects to it. So when you have uh, data uh, coming in, so I was talking about uh, catalogs that are created by the data engineering teams. Those can con uh, contain uh, customer information, transaction information, and product information, all relevant for demand forecasting projects. You can monitor whether there is something wrong going on with that data, and you can set up alerting on that, which uh, can notify the users and data scientists before actually they start training in the first place. And then there can be also a, a monitoring table set up on the prediction that a data scientists generate. And this can be done on the data properties, but also on the model drift itself, if you know the ground truth. And that's one of the limitations of pretty much any monitoring system that is out there these days. You must know the ground truth before you actually can say whether there is something going wrong with your model. And it can be too late. Uh, so it's important really to track that very well. So I mentioned a lot of tools uh, that are there out there on the Databricks platform. And this is the whole overview of all the tools that are relevant for MLOps. We have an orchestration, which is Databricks workflows. We have experiment tracking. We use MLflow for that. Compute, which is Databricks compute. It can be serverless. It can be standard compute. There are different options for depending on what you need to do. There is feature engineering. It's a dedicated feature engineering package uh, that integrates with Unity Catalog. You have model registry, which is also Unity Catalog, but you use MLflow to register your models. You have serving, model serving, feature serving, model serving with feature lookups, all variations of that. Um, you have monitoring, you have observability and vector search, which are LLM related features. And you have two components which matter a lot. It's a governance component for Unity Catalog, where you can ba basically know everything about what's going on with your systems. And you have Glue, which is the Databricks asset bundle, which is relevant for anyone doing anything on Databricks, pretty much. Um, but didn't we just make it all more complicated, right? We started with a notebook, which had 1,000 lines of code. And now we have you know, a package. We have many scripts. We have many arguments and all of that. And just why, why did we do that, right? Why? So I've done it many times in my career. Then that's something that just doesn't necessarily make your life more complicated. The risk of mistakes is significantly reduced. Uh, and mistakes can be very expensive. They can be worth millions of dollars. Time pr to production, you would think it goes up, but it actually goes down because Data science teams can be fully responsible for the whole product end to end without relying on other teams like DevOps teams. And um, you know, this relationship between two teams tend to make things a lot more complicated, building the wall between different departments. And in corporate set uh, setup, proper MLOs practices can bring millions. And that's something that I've done multiple times over my career myself. Um, so it might be hard to do things the right way from the very beginning, but once you learn to do it right, it will be hard to do it wrong. And uh, that's why I believe everyone should, should be adopting MLOps in the right way. So if you want to learn more, we have a course on this topic, end-to-end uh, -to -end MLOps with Databricks. Um, please feel uh, free to scan the QR code. And uh, if you're interested, I can uh, tell you more about it. And um, I'm also writing a book on MLOps with Databricks for O'Reilly coming in January 2026. Uh, it has a cute chick on it. It's, I don't know why they chose it. I wanted a lion, but they have a chick, so <laughs> it's pretty funny. And your early release is already available, so you can find it on the O'Reilly platform. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, please ask me. And I can throw a crab at you if you ask me a question.